Hello, welcome to chapter four. Chapter four of Wisconsin history is called the Fur Trade Era, Exploration and Exchange. At the bottom of this page, well, at the right, we have a map of Wisconsin, of course, and all of the um, major trading centers, as well as the Indian village near the trading centers, and then the the gray lines here are the modern day borders. So this chapter is the time, the timeline is about 1600. So before Europe arrived, a lot of that time was in our chapter three. In the mid 1600s, um, the French started to come in and controlled the Great Lakes, mostly for the fur trade. So um, there's a lot of fur trading going on in the mid 1600s. Um, and then moving on into the 1700s, throughout that 100 years, more forts and trading ports, trading posts were being built throughout Wisconsin. You can see the map up above. And then the timeline on the next page, page 59, um, the French and Indian War broke out, which I think we'll learn about more in this chapter. And um, the British then came over and took over the fur trade. So the French went away and uh, well, there are still some French, but the British took over um, the Great Lakes. And eventually in the 1800s, the United States uh, took control of the Great Lakes fur trade. Uh, so that's just a very brief timeline there. Let's get to it. Exploring and learning. In this chapter, you'll read about the Europeans who arrived in Wisconsin in the 1600s. The explorers and those who followed them brought materials the Indians had never seen. In exchange, the Indians taught them much about living in Wisconsin. This is the story of the time known as the fur trade era. Wade House is between Sheboygan and Fond du Lac in Sheboygan County. Here's the little um, point on the map here. Old World Wisconsin is outside of Eagle. Both of these historic sites are in the eastern ridges and lowland region. So Old World Wisconsin is kind of over by Milwaukee. If you ever have a chance to get over there, you should. It's really fun, especially around uh, the holiday time, like in December. Are you an explorer? Are you curious? Do you like to learn new things? Do you ask a lot of questions? Do you like to use library books or search the internet to find answers to your questions? Do you like to travel to new places? If you answered yes to any of those questions, well, then you are an explorer. Perhaps you and your family will explore a national park like Yellowstone or the Grand Canyon this summer. Or maybe you will visit a state park like Wyalusing near Prairie du Chien. There you can see where the Wisconsin River flows into the Mississippi River. In chapter three, you learned about the work that archeologists do to learn about the past. After reading this chapter, you may decide that archeologists are explorers too. Archeologists use tools such as spade shovels, trowels, and screens to discover artifacts and clues at sites. Then they use tape measures and notebooks to describe what they found. Explorers use maps to travel to and discover new places. Both archaeologists and explorers work with land and waterways. Archaeologists dig or dive down to explore different layers of history. Explorers travel out over the land and water to discover new and different places. At Old World Wisconsin, visitors learn about the past by taking part in the work of the past. The boy is grooming one of the horses, just as he might have done if he had lived on a Wisconsin farm 100 years ago. At Wade House, this young girl learns how to make an S-hook from the blacksmith. What equipment do you see in this picture that would not have been there 150 years ago? Why do you think it's there now? What I'm seeing are these goggles 150 years ago they might not have used eye protection we've learned since then the importance of eye protection right <laughs> hiking in the wisconsin woods is a great way to explore the beauty of our state you can do that right at hickson forest right in our backyard of lacrosse what did explorers hope to find in wisconsin 
Explorers started coming to Wisconsin over 400 years ago, some, far, some from as far away as Europe. Some of these explorers came looking for rivers and routes to the west. Others came looking for fur-bearing animals such as beaver, mink, and otter. Some explorers stopped their exploring and stayed put. They lived with Indian people and learned their languages and their traditions. Many, many things have changed in Wisconsin since then. But there is still plenty of exploring to do here today. Some early explorers like this one used trump lines, tump lines, straps of fabric over the forehead to carry heavy packs. Ooh, that sounds uncomfortable. Many groups of Eastern Woodland Indians moved to Wisconsin in the early 1600s. What events pushed them here? What kind of resources pulled them to this area? Native people near the close of the old time. Here we can see this map, the arrows, the yellow orange arrows are the movement of an Indian group. So in the Northern Wisconsin, um, the Ojibwe are coming in on um, the Eastern, the Ottawa, the Mis Meskwaki and the Potawatomi. And then from the South, the Kickapoo, the Potawatomi, the Meshutin, the Sauk, the Miami, and then the Potawatomi came up North and then went back down. <laughs> so we'll describe, talk about why that was happening. How did Indian people live in the old time? The time before Europeans and other new groups arrived is known as the old time among Indian people. Toward the end of the old time, Ho-Chunk people lived in villages on the open prairies and in stands of oak trees in the southern part of Wisconsin. They farmed and hunted for food. They also gathered wild rice and caught fish. Farther north, Menominee people lived in a large village near what is now called Green Bay. They hunted bear and deer, and they grew corn, beans, and pumpkins. They gathered wild rice and caught fish, too. Sometimes Ho-Chunk and Menominee people hunted together for buffalo. Ojibwe people lived still farther north. The short growing season made gardening difficult. The Ojibwe people traveled from season to season to hunt and gather food enough, gather enough food to live. Many of the Indian groups traded tools and jewelry with each other. They also traded with other Indian groups living outside of what we now call Wisconsin. The old time came to a close when people from Europe began exploring the Great Lake areas. All Indian groups in Wisconsin had to adapt greatly to live with non-Indian ways. Life became more and more complicated for everyone. The left here is a picture of Francis Mike, a lac court oriales. I might be saying that incorrectly. Ojibwe woman, harvests wild rice. What Indian people lived here when explorers arrived? Around 1500, Europeans started traveling to North America. These newcomers brought new trade goods with them, such as glass beads, iron pots, and guns. They also carried their diseases. These diseases killed many Indians. Different groups of Europeans fought one another and Indians over land. Many Indians were forced west because of these conflicts. Some Eastern woodland groups from the Northeast came to Wisconsin. Ancestors of the Ho-Chunk and Menominee people had lived here for thousands of years. By the early 1600s, the Santee Sioux Indians also lived in Wisconsin. Eastern woodland nations arrived later. They were pushed into Wisconsin by conflicts in the Northeast. The Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Ottawa have stories that tell of their beginnings here, journeys to the east, then returning. With so many different groups of Indian people now living in Wisconsin, life was changing in big ways for everyone. Some groups got along with each other. These groups shared ideas, tools, and traditions. Other groups competed for land to live on and control of resources and trading routes. On the right here, or at the top, Red Cliff Ojibwe Indian Marvin Defoe built this birch bark canoe in the late 1990s. He built it just as his ancestors built their canoes. That's cool. Menominee, Ho-Chunk, and other Indian groups hunted for buffalo, which are also called bison. These bison are part of a captive herd that live 
lives in the Sandhill Wildlife Area in Wood County. All right, on to page 64. How did explorers travel to Wisconsin? Explorers such as Jean Nicolette may have traveled with some Huron Indians by canoes through the Straits of Mackinac. Mackinac is how we pronounce that. Mackinac. The Straits connected Lake Huron with Lake Michigan. Indian people lived in Wisconsin in the 1600s, traveled on foot and by canoe. They had no horses. However, the Midwest was rich in lakes and rivers that were used like water highways. Indian people had been traveling these water highways thousands of years before the first explorers from Europe arrived. Rivers in Wisconsin link the Great Lakes with the Mississippi River. After traveling south from Green Bay on the Fox River, Indian people then portaged their canoes and goods a short distance to reach the Wisconsin River. They traveled the Wisconsin River until it flowed into the Mississippi River near Prairie du Chien. With your finger, trace the waterway highway routes yourself and imagine traveling those distances by canoe about 400 years ago. How might the water in the landscape have looked? What would be different today? Looks like there's arrows. You can follow the arrows. All of them end up in the Mississippi River. And I pronounce this as Jean Nicolette, but I, it's a French name, so it'd be Jean Nicolet, the first European explorer to, most people have believed to land in Wisconsin. Jean Nicolet, who is he? Nicolet was born in France. As a young man, he traveled to New France. Today, New France is known as Canada. Nicolet was hired by a French company to find Indian trading partners. Nicolet was about 36 years old when he began to explore new lands. Members of three Indian nations met the explorer when he visited them at a place now called Red Banks near Green Bay in 1634. They were the Menominee, Ho-Chunk, and Potawatomi. He lived with several different Canadian Indian groups and learned their languages and traditions. Nicolet had traveled by canoe about 700 miles. In these travels, he met many different people. He saw parts of the Midwest that only Indians knew about. After Nicolet's visit, he returned to Canada. We know that Nic Nicolet wrote notes about his explorations in Wisconsin. Sadly, none of his records survive. We know about this trip through the writings of a priest who knew Nicolet. Picture here, explorer Jean Nicolet wore a robe of Chinese silk when he landed somewhere near Green Bay in 1634, but no one is sure what the robe of Nicolet looked like when he arrived. The paintings on these two pages were created around 300 years later. What differences can you find in these two paintings? Maybe this is the first painting here. There's another one. Missionaries and map makers. Why did more French explorers and priests come to Wisconsin? Some of the French explorers brought Jesuit missionaries with them on their trips to study Wisconsin. Both the explorers and missionaries were sent by the government of French Canada. The Jesuits came to teach their religion to different groups of Indian people living here. Father Jacques Marquette, let's make sure I'm saying his name right. Jacques Marquette was a missionary from Canada who had lived with different Indian groups. First, he went to Chequagamagan Bay and then near Green Bay. Some of the tribal people told him about the big river that we now call the Mississippi. In 1673, the Jesuits leaders sent Father Marquette off to find the big river. He was 36 years old at the time. A trade a trader named Louis Zoliet. I'm looking at the bottom of the page to help me pronounce this. Louis Zoliet was, anyway, he was 28 who and he joined him. Marquette and Zoliet arrived at the Mississippi River in 1673. Indians living in the area helped them. 
Zoliet later drew maps of their journey. His maps caused a turning point in history. They showed new routes to the Mississippi River Valley. With new maps, new people from France and French Canada became coming to the area. Explorer Jacques Marquette and Louis, Louis Zoliet arrived at the Mississippi River in June 1673. Indians living in the area helped them. Zoliet drew this map from memory the year after their journey. There's his map. That's interesting. See the Great Lakes there? <laughs> Both Marquette and Joliet kept journals during their trip, but Joliet's journal was lost. Here you see a part of page 11 of Father Marquette's journal. He was writing about seeing the Mississippi River for the first time. Here is what he wrote. We arrived at the mouth of our river and we found it at 42 and a half degrees of elevation. We entered happily into the Mississippi on the 17th of June, 1673, with a joy that I cannot explain. Can you find Marquette's spelling for the Mississippi Riviere? Is the French word for river. Why do you think Marquette was so happy to find this river? Here's how he spelled M I S S I S I P I. Well, a little bit different than how we spell it. Just as with Nicolette, we Nicolet, we do not know how Marquette and Joliet, Joliet looked. German-born Milwaukee artist Frank H. Zeltzer made this painting in 1921. Beavers mean business, the French fur trade. What was the fur trade? The fur trade was an important early business through the Great Lakes. When explorers from France and France and French-speaking Canada began showing up in Wisconsin in the 1600s, they discovered that Indians hunted beaver, mink, and otter for both food and clothing. The pelts from these animals made especially warm clothing, and the hats made from the beaver pelts were very popular in Europe. Soon, French traders started arriving here to buy such pelts. They did not pay money to the Indian people for the pelts. Instead, they traded things like blankets, metal cooking pots, and axe heads, woolen fabric for clothing, and glass beads. They traded French goods for Indian goods. Historians named this exchange system the fur trade. Indians traded more than fur. They also traded, traded wild rice, maple sugar, fish, venison, canoes, and information about travel routes. Indians showed the traders how to use snowshoes and moccasins. Indians taught traders how to survive the cold winter outdoors. Here's our picture caption. Who would have guessed that Europeans' desire for this small furry animal would be a turning point in the history of the native people of North America? Why did the French and Canadian trade for beaver pelts? Well, because back home, hats made of beaver fur felt and coats trimmed with beaver fur were very popular. Everybody wanted one, so French traders made a lot of money selling the pelts. How did the fur trade exchange affect the Indian way of life? The exchange of furs for metal, tools, and cooking pots changed the Indian ways of life forever. The need to trap more and more fur pelts took some Indian men further away from their family camps and villages. The longer they are away from home, the more work the Indian women and children had to take on. Their work roles and their family roles slowly began to change. Because Indians could trade for metal items, they spent less time crafting traditional stone tools or birch bark and pottery containers. Why were trading posts important to the fur trade? As the fur trade grew, French traders created a gathering spot on Madeline Island. Madeline Island is in Lake Superior, just off the northern tip of Wisconsin. The French named it La Pointe. It became a place for both French and Indian traders to meet and exchange goods. Traders could also get food and travel supplies at this trading post. Soon, the French built a second trading post called La Baie near what is now Green Bay. The French built a trading post they named Prairie de Chine, where the Wisconsin River flows into the Mississippi River. It was an important meeting place for both Indian and French traders. They came every spring when the ice broke and water highways were ready for traffic again. 
the French named this annual gathering event the Rendezvous. Trading took place at the Rendezvous, but it also was a time to have fun. French and Indian traders exchanged customs, language, and ideas about how to live and also traded goods. Here's those trading posts that we talked about. This painting by Francis Ann Hopkins shows how many people could fit in the type of canoes that fur traders used. Bringing cultures together. Understanding mixed ancestry in the 1800s. During the years of the fur trade, some of the men from Europe and Canada married Indian women. Their children of mixed ancestry learned languages and customs from the cultures of both parents. In 1810, near the end of the fur trade era in the Great Lakes region, a girl named Elizabeth Therese Fisher was born in Prairie du Chien. Her father was Henry Fisher, a fur trader. Her mother had ancestors that included French Canadians and Native Americans. Elizabeth's great-great-grandfather was Kanakat, an Ottawa Indian. As Elizabeth grew up, her mother taught her how to speak both French and English. Elizabeth also learned Ottawa customs and traditions from her family and other Native people she met at the trading post. Elizabeth's mother or aunt taught her how to embroider this sampler. A sampler is a hand-stitched cloth that shows the skills of the person who stitched it. Making samplers of different embroidery stitches was an important skill for girls growing up in the 1800s. What happened when Elizabeth grew up? In 1824, when Elizabeth was 14 years old, 14, she married Henry Bard. It was common back then for men and women to marry at younger ages. Henry was born in Ireland and came to the United States as a boy. Together, they moved to Green Bay, where they lived for many years. Henry was a lawyer. He worked with the Ho-Chunk and Menominee Indians during this time. Oh, during this time, both tribes were forced to cede their lands to the United States government. Like many Native women, Elizabeth helped Henry translate Native languages for his French clients. Before she died in 1890, Elizabeth wrote down her memories of growing up near the end of the fur trade era. These memoirs are now part of the Wisconsin Historical Society's collection. Many artifacts from Elizabeth's childhood are also part of these collections. Elizabeth learned how to make the doll in this toy cradle board. She also added the beads and ribbons according to Ottawa custom. Oh, and this is a picture of Elizabeth Therese Fisher Bard as an adult. From French to British control. What was the French and Indian War? Hmm, we saw that on the timeline at the beginning of this. The Indians and the French had been successful partners in the fur trade for many decades when the British began arriving in Wisconsin. The British also were looking for furs. They wanted to take control of the French trading posts, forts, and posts. The British wanted to be in charge of what is now Wisconsin. Most Wisconsin Indians were comfortable with the French as trading partners. The Indians wanted to continue trading with the French. Between 1756 and 1763, the French and the British fought for control of the trading forts and water highways in the Midwest and Canada. Historians call this series of battles the French and Indian War. The French didn't have enough soldiers and supplies. In 1766, I'm sorry, 1763, the last of the French forts surrendered to the British. Many, many Indians fought against the British, but now the British controlled, controlled the fur trade. Indians had to adapt once again. This map, the French controlled the Wisconsin fur trade before 1763, as you can tell by the French names on the map. The Burnett County Historical Society rebuilt Forts Folle full, full of one to look very much like it did 200 years ago. Did you know that uh, full of one is French for wild rice? Today, you can visit and get a good idea of how the trading posts looked. What happened to the French forts after the war? After the war, French soldiers and leaders left their forts and posts and returned to France. 
However, many French and French Canadian fur traders stayed in Wisconsin. They continued to work with the different Indian groups to trap and trade animal pelts. They shipped bundles of fur on the same water highways as before, but they were now selling the bundles to British trading companies. The fighting during the French and Indian War did not take place in Wisconsin, but the war affected Wisconsin. Soldiers and others moved about to fight or protect forts. French and British soldiers had traveled through Wisconsin and occupied the forts. Some Wisconsin Indian groups had traveled east from Wisconsin to fight for the French. All these travelers told people about the rich forests, prairies, and water highways they saw. Sharing this information brought other newcomers to Wisconsin. After 1763, the British took control of the fur trade. Native and French people still lived in the area, but they were no longer in charge. Here you see an Indian interpreter explaining native life outside. Boy, I look at how to pronounce that again. It's all the way up here. Full of one. Historical, historic interpreters bring history to life by wearing costumes and using artifacts from the past. Inside the fort of Fall of Juan today, you can see a man dressed as a trader. He displays the kind of trade goods that Indians could select in exchange for furs. Americans take over the fur trade. How did the American Revolution affect the fur trade? In the early 1600s, the British were some of the first Europeans to settle permanently in the New World. Then, 150 years later, some British colonists wanted to form their own independent country. The war between Great Britain and the colonists lasted eight years. This war is known as the American Revolution. The colonists won control of their country and the fur trade, but the British didn't leave right away. The fighting during the American Revolution had little effect on the fur trade in Wisconsin. Trading between the Indians, French, and British continued much as it had before. After the revolution, the British were supposed to leave the trading posts in Wisconsin by 1796, but some of them remained here. The new U.S. leaders were busy setting up a federal government in Washington, D.C. They didn't send people to Wisconsin to stop the British from controlling the fur trade. It was over 700 miles from Washington, D.C. to Wisconsin. The new U.S. government could not force the British to leave. American control of the fur trade began after 1815, following the War of 1812. How did the War of 1812 affect the fur trade? The American Revolution was not the last time that British and U.S. troops fought each other. They fought again in the War of 1812. During this war, most of the battles happened outside of Wisconsin. In 1814, U.S. Trips, troops quickly built a fort at Prairie du Chien. British forces demanded surrender of the fort, but the United States refused. The British attacked. After three days of shooting, the United States surrendered the fort. By 1815, the war was over. Finally, the British agreed to leave Wisconsin. They either returned to Britain or moved to Canada and continued working in the fur trade. The Indians and French fur traders once again adapted. Now they would work for the United States. We know about what happened to Fort Shelby when the British arrived from the account given by Augustine Greenoy. He was a fur trader who fought for the British and later became a U.S. citizen. This photograph of Augustine was taken 30 or 35 years after the Fort Shelby battle. He is holding an ax that could also be used as a pipe. Why do you think Augustine had his photograph taken with it? American and British troops fought for control of the fort you see in this picture during the War of 1812 in Prairie du Chien on the banks of the Mississippi River. It was called Fort Shelby by the Americans and renamed Fort McKay by the British. Why do you think both armies wanted a fort located on a large river like the Mississippi? Hmm. From forts to settlement. Why did the US government build military forts at Prairie du Chien, at Green Bay, and at Portage? After the War of 1812, the US government quickly took over the fur trade business. The government built two military forts in Wisconsin to protect important trade locations. 
Fort Crawford near Prairie du Chien, and Fort Howard at Green Bay. A few years later, the United States built Fort Winnebago at the portage between the Fox and Wisconsin rivers. Each fort had a hospital nearby. The U.S. soldiers stationed at these forts were responsible for keeping control of Wisconsin's waterways for the fur trade. They also chopped down trees and built roads. The first road in Wisconsin was known as the Military Road. It was built to connect the three forts by land as well as by the Fox Wisconsin waterways. You can bike on part of the Military Road today. The 40-mile Military Ridge State Trail in Iowa and Dane counties connects Dodgeville and Madison. Here you can see this map shows the routes of the Military Road between Fort Howard at Green Bay to Winnebago at Portage and on to Fort Crawford at Prairie du Chien. Juliette Majil Kinsey was the first woman to write about life on the Wisconsin frontier in her book, Wa Bun. In the early 1830s, Juliet Kinsey lived near Fort Winnebago with her husband, John. He was the Indian agent at Portage. He worked to protect the interests of the United States in the area. Juliet Kinsey painted this view of Portage and Fort Winnebago in 1831. How did the US government cause conflicts among people already living in Wisconsin? The US government built and ran three military forts in Wisconsin. The government also affected the lives of the different Indian groups living in Wisconsin. First, the government appointed agents to work with the Indians. Some of the agents work was helpful, some was harmful to native cultures. These Indian agents were hired to work with the Indian people. The government wanted the Indians to become more like non-Indians. This was called assimilation policy. Second, the U.S. government also ran trading, trading houses for the Indians. That way, Indians would be less likely to trade with any French or Frit British traders still in the area. Finally, the U.S. government created new fur trade rules and local governments run only by white men. Native people and French people had been marrying, raising families, and working together for many years. These new rules and decisions did not reflect their values and customs. Many of the Indian nations resented the way that the U.S. government treated them. The French felt that the newcomers did not respect their trading traditions. The U.S. government now controlled the fur trade. At the top here, we have Salomon Juno, who was a French-Canadian fur trader. In 1818, he took over his father-in-law's trading post at Milwaukee. Soon after, he became the first non-Indian person to plan a village in Milwaukee. Later, Solomon Juno served as Milwaukee's first mayor, its first postmaster, and its first newspaper editor. Here we have an early drawing of the home where Solomon Juno and his family lived. He and his wife, Josette, had 17 children. Whoa! On this map, you can see that Juno's early settlement was between the Milwaukee River and Lake Michigan. Why do you think this was a good location for a trading post? Hmm. Changes over 200 years. What have you learned about exploration and exchange in Wisconsin? In this chapter, you've explored some of Wisconsin's major highways. You've learned how explorers from France and, France and Canada found their way to and through Wisconsin with the help of Indian guides. You've seen how the Indians began exchanging beaver, mink, and otter furs with traders from France and Canada. As the fur trade grew, the lives of native people changed. Men traveled further from home to hunt and trap. Women took on all the responsibilities of gardening, gathering, and child raising. Native people began using more goods made in Europe instead of making everything they needed from the resources around them. Exploration and the fur exchange in Wisconsin caused many new peoples to move here. At first, the newcomers were Indian groups from the East Coast and traders from France, Canada, and Britain. Then, after the War of 1812, people from the United States began arriving. In the next chapter, you'll read how the story of Wisconsin continued to change. While some people still made their, their livings through the fur trade, others were drawn here by rich deposits of lead ore. Others came to Wisconsin to buy land and work for the US government. The conflicts continued over values and ideas about land. <laughs>
you'll discover that change is still part of everyday life in Wisconsin. Here we have a picture. Europeans brought many goods to trade with the Indians, such as the powder horn and the earrings you see here. Why do you think the Indians wanted them? On the last page here, there's a list of places to visit. And um, if you are interested in reading more, there are some books that you could read more about the fur trade. Awesome, thank you.